I got to LA <clears throat> and I was on my way to my my cousin's house. I had, another, I had a lot of cousins. And my cousin Robert was a year younger than me. And the last time I'd seen him was when I was six and he was five. And then he disappeared. And so I thought what I'd do is knock on his door. He was living with my Aunt Sylvia. <clears throat> and it blew their minds. <clears throat> they, didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, they didn't know I was coming. They didn't know what I looked like. I figured they'd open the door and they'd say, yeah. And I'd say, it's me, it's Ronnie. You know? I mean, I was 17 years old. So I'm going to their house. I'm walking down the street on my way to Burbank. I didn't even know where Burbank was. I was itching. And I get arrested. I didn't get arrested. I get stopped by the cops. The policeman drives up and says, excuse me, where are you going? And I was hitched. I didn't even know where I was. I was going to Burbank. I said, I'm going to Burbank. And he said, where are you coming from? And I said, you know, what do you care? It's none of your business. You know, who are you? You know, I didn't do anything wrong. Getting back in the car. I said, look, I'm going to my aunt's house. He calls my aunt up. Completely blew the surprise. And he tells my aunt, do you know somebody named Ronnie Landfield? And she says, of course, my nephew Ronnie. Take him right, you know, the guy drove me home, drove me to my aunt's house. She covered for me, she was very cool. And she was very happy to see me. I hadn't seen my cousin, I hadn't seen my aunt since I was six. And here I was 17 years old. And they invited me to stay with them. I stayed with them for about 10 days. And then my aunt says, Ronnie, you're a really bad influence on your cousin. My cousin was in high school. She wanted him to become a lawyer. And here I am. I dropped out of school. I'm an artist. I'm kind of like, I'm like a, a character out of a Dylan song or something. And so I said, it's okay. I said, just um, drop me at UCLA and I'll be fine. So she drove me to... Uh, Westwood to UCLA and she dropped me on the campus. And what was in my head was I I, I, I like this I the story's a little it's all very vague. I mean this is nineteen sixty four. How many years ago was that? Nearly fifty <laughs> years ago, man. I mean it's like uh anyway, she drops me on the campus. When I was a kid <clears throat> when I was a little kid, my parents used to take me to this hotel in the Catskill Mountains. And one summer, there was a guy there named Gary Beckman. And Gary, he was 15 at the time. He was the lifeguard at the pool. Gary's ambition in those days was to go to UCLA. And I figured Gary was at UCLA. I mean, it was, that must have been 1960. One or 60 when he said he was going to go and so I figured he went and I figured if my aunt dropped me on the campus I'll find Gary so I looked for Gary and he was not a student but he was a former student and so uh, they gave me a number where they th thought I could reach him in the meantime I went to the art department check it out. And at the art department I met a couple of girls and they asked me if I needed a place to stay and they put me up in their apartment and I think it was the first day I was there, it might have been the second day I was there at the UCLA art department. <clears throat> but I got into a fight <clears throat> with Billy Al Bankston, who I would call a complete moron and you can leave that in. Bankston and I start fighting over what's better, L.A. art or New York art. I mean, give me a break. This guy's 35 years old. He's probably teaching there. I'm a 17 years old New York City kid, and we're having this fight over what's better, the New York art world or the L.A. art world. And I'm saying it's all plastic, and he's telling me it's all like this kind of like 
egotistical shit, and we're we're going at each other. And this guy comes along and breaks us up, and takes me for a ride. I go with him. He and it was great. He takes me to the Ferris Gallery. I got to see. I think there was, as I remember, there was. I remember these Lichtenstein landscapes, which were uh, maybe it was a show of Lichtenstein. It was the first time I'd ever been to Ferris. He takes me to the Duan Gallery. I saw Kenny Price's work for the first time. He takes me up and down to the, gallery, the hip galleries in La Cienega. And then he took me back to, to UCLA. I mean, it was like a, a way of calming things down, breaking up the fight, and introducing me to the LA art world, which is very kind of him. And, um, and I still remember that very vividly. You know? um, so, soon after, I got seriously bored with L.A. for good reason. I mean, the weather never changes. It's, it's 80 degrees every day, which after a while you grow tired of. So um, I did find my friend Gary Beckman. He was, uh, had left UCLA. He was living in L.A. He got so excited that I was there, he insisted I stay with him. I stayed with him for about a week. And uh, I remember his girlfriend, Brenda, she was a sweetheart. And I said to Gary, uh, I'm out of here, man. He drove me to Malibu and I hitchhiked up to San Francisco. You've probably seen his photographs of me when I was 17 in that catalog that the Butler Institute produced. There's a picture of me and that Gary Beckman took that picture as I started to hitchhike up to San Francisco. And in my bag, I had a whole bunch of work in my bag that I had been doing at my aunt's house and in, at Gary's house, and I continued in when I wound up in Berkeley. This was me trying to find my own voice. What I had started doing was I was experimenting with cray paws because I, I couldn't paint on the road. And I had cray paws and I was doing hard edge. I was beginning to go these hard edge stripes. That's why I like David, uh, David Simpson's work. He was one of the first people whose hard edges I saw. And I was kind of contrasting that against kind of painterly um, scribbles that would be like kind of shapes that were kind of abstracted. So it was a contrast between the ground, hard edge stripes. <clears throat> and I should say, before I left New York, um, I met Hans Hoffman at Coots. This was in that period when I was looking for Gary, uh, my friend Gary, and I was thinking about going to California. I met Hoffman, and I talked to him. And the very last paintings that I did on Bleecker Street in the Bowery were these Hoffman-esque works on paper. They were oil paint where I stained the oil. And then I took tape and I made hard edge boxes floating against the oil paint, uh, floated against the stain. So I was trying to contrast the two and I think that was my take on how to get out of it. How to get out of the abstract expressionist trap. <clears throat> the gestural trap. And um, those paintings I left with my friend who ultimately photographed a few of them. So I have them on my website. But to my chagrin, he destroyed all the work I left with him. Which is... Uh, Maybe I should give him a bill at this point for 75 or 80 or 150. By the way, if you're watching, uh, the bill's in the mail. Uh, paintings of mine that he destroyed. Many paintings of mine. But I'll give him his points. He did take slides and send them to me when I, I needed them in California. After he visited me in California, pissed off every friend I had, and came back to New York. Charming. At any rate... Um, um, 
Can we stop for a minute or so? No. Huh? No. <laughs> no. After I hitchhiked to San Francisco, um, I got bored in San Francisco. I had, a, I had a cousin, another cousin, different cousin, who gave me a job. And he, he does market research. So I was doing market research, which entailed calling people on a telephone and asking questions. And I was living with his boss, who was pitching, who was kind enough to put me up. Then I was living with some woman who worked for their company. She was also very kind and put me up. I remember, I think I even slept in her bed. I mean, she was so sweet. Her name was Marty, weirdly enough. But I got bored, and I decided to check out the Art Institute. I needed to check out the Art Institute. Because, you know, for a 17-year-old kid, that was art. You know, you go to art school. And so I went and checked out the Art Institute. It was in the evening, and I had another cousin who I had heard was... Uh, living and going to school in Berkeley. And to me, like New York City, Brooklyn, San Francisco, Berkeley. I thought Berkeley, like Brooklyn, was just like a, you know, you get on a bus, you go to... So I asked this kid who was in the lobby of the Art Institute where Berkeley was. And he told me where Berkeley, how to get to Berkeley. And what you do is you go down to the Bay, Bay Bridge, bus terminal and you take a bus so I figured it was like a city bus I didn't realize you had to go over the Bay Bridge and it was a so I took a bus to Berkeley and again to keep this tape clean I'll skip over what I did that night with this girl that I met on the bus but in the morning I went to my cousin's house and actually I went there in the evening that's where it's funny because I met him yesterday on the street. Not my cousin, but this guy I knew. Um, I went to my cousin's house and he wasn't there. And to make a long story short, I went back the next morning and they invited me to move into the house. I moved into the house. I turned the back room into my bedroom and into my studio. And that's when I started the painting again in Berkeley. I never went back to San Francisco. I called my cousin, I thanked him. <coughs> and I stayed in Berkeley for the next year and a half. And um, I went to a local art supply store. I bought Lipitex. It was the, my first acrylic paint. And when I was in Kansas City, before I went to Kansas City in New York City, um, when I was going to art and design, I learned about KC. So the, 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 the um, mediums that I used were oil paint, primarily oil paint, oil paint on paper, oil paint on canvas, and KC, and India ink, and charcoal. But basically, um, acrylics, were somewhat crude. I mean, they had really just come on the market. So in 1964, when I found myself in Berkeley, ready to make a fresh start, um, I just bought acrylic paint. Because at that point, I was doing hard edge paintings. And I started making hard edge paintings in my back room, as well as these, uh, I continued doing these cray pot drawings, of which, uh, they're all on my website. I have most of those. <clears throat> Loretta Howard showed a few of those uh, a couple of years ago. Loretta has a very interesting gallery, and uh, I sort of, I was in the first show she did in her new space on 68th Street. She's since moved to 26th Street. But she framed up 19 works on paper that I did in Kansas City and on the road. It's 63, 64. She sold a couple from 63. Uh, which I think are the only ones I ever sold from that period. And uh, she showed some of the 64 drawings. I, I have most of them here. 
but those were my transitionary works. And um, that moved me into finding my own voice. Changed my life. Stephen Green. When I eventually enrolled at the San Francisco Institute, I remember uh, I was painting in the painting studio on this big hard edge painting, which is about seven feet high, six feet wide. And this kid who was painting in the same studio asked me if I'd had heard about the post painterly abstraction show. I said, no, I didn't. And he told me that one of the stars of the show was this artist named Kenneth Nolan, who I'd never heard of. So, I mean, it was in context. You know, that this guy named Clement Greenberg had curated the show. I think I'd heard of Greenberg, but I didn't really know. So I was doing hard edge paintings and stripe paintings before I'd ever heard of Kenneth Nolan or Gene Davis for that matter. Well, no, I think I knew Gene Davis. I think I knew of his work from the art magazines. I knew a little bit more than most kids. Uh, this guy who came out to see me also brought his girlfriend and this other guy with him named Lenny. And Lenny was a driver for Art Card. And Lenny came, and, and just, he was the guest who came to stay. I put him up in my, I put him all up in my house in Berkeley. And Lenny used to tell me about Neil Williams, and he used to tell me about these artist studios that he had visited. And in that period, actually, um, before I went California. Like I said, I grew up and went to school in ground zero for the art world. Uh, Tom Wesselman was teaching in my high school and Tom was showing at this gallery called the Green Gallery, which is right up the block from art and design. So my friends and I, or my friend and I, we used to often go to Green Gallery and we would ask Dick Bellamy to take out Wesselman paintings and show us what he had, and we'd go in the back and with Bellamy would show us stuff. <clears throat> and then in the interim, when I was sharing the, the loft from Leland Bell with this guy, with this friend of mine, um, during that fall of 1963, and the period where Kennedy got shot, uh, I remember working every once in a while they needed extra help at Art Car. So they'd, they'd give me, uh, you know, a day. And I remember going to Jim Rosenquist's studio. Uh, you know, this is unforgettable stuff. And moving his second show, which included the sculpture Tumbleweed, which is a very famous sculpture he made out of barbed wire. And we, we moved that show from Jim's studio down on, uh, I guess, River Street, wherever he was, up to uh, the Green Gallery on 57th Street. So in those days, I was a 16-year-old kid, but I met Rosenquist, and we've been friends, really, or, you know, hi, how you doing, ever since. Uh, Jim's a terrific person, and I remember I once met his father, and his father knew who I was, and it really blew me away. This was like 30 years ago. Um, and those were the days. <laughs>